Welcome. Welcome to the service today. We're glad you're all here. Glad you're watching online. Thanks for being here. Uh, thank you for continuing to be cautious in regards to uh, coronavirus. Again, we, we still encourage air hugs and not the real thing or high fives or handshaking or any of that stuff. We, but we can give air hugs. Air hugs work, work pretty well. But anyway, welcome today. Well, as far as announcements uh, go, we'll be having board meetings this afternoon at 2.30 or uh, for those of you tonight, that's tomorrow afternoon at 2.30. Uh, and then Wednesday night, we'll have our Bible study prayer time together. Uh, we've been having some good times uh, there. Also, uh, tonight, Sunday night at 6 o'clock our time on Facebook, our Board of Bishops will be having a uh, what they're calling continuing the conversation. Uh, a couple weeks ago, they had a, uh, an initial one of these, and it's a discussion on, uh, well, they, their subtitle for it is Disarming Racial Divides in the church and like i said this is a follow-up to what they did a couple weeks ago i would strongly uh, recommend it it was excellent the first time uh, very helpful and uh, much needed in these days so uh, be aware of that uh, i also mentioned the buckets are in the back or you can give online as well uh, for for your online giving well let's worship together but before we sing let's uh, let's enter into worship through prayer heavenly father we thank you for this day we thank you for this opportunity to worship together to unite our hearts before you, Lord. You are so good, so faithful, so true. And we just, we just thank you for this opportunity today uh, to spend this time together with you. Lord, to help us to open our hearts to all that you have for us, Lord. We give you praise. We give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's worship together as we sing. <laughs>
pray together. Lord, we want to be an offering to you. We, we want to just lay our lives into your hands. Lord, there's no better place than we can put our, our lives. There's no better, no, nothing better we can do with our lives than to offer them up to you in worship, sacrificing our, ourselves for you because of what Jesus has done for us and how he sacrificed, how he came from heaven, the majesty of heaven to earth to become one of us and, and to live a, a perfect, sinless life and, and then to pay the ultimate sacrifice. He, he went to a cross. After being beaten and bruised, he, he went to a cross to die for us. Lord, we, we're so thankful that the only natural response to what Jesus has done for us is to, to offer ourselves back to you. You have been so good to us, so faithful to us. And Lord, we just praise your name today. You are good. You are holy. You are, are full of, of love. You are full of joy and peace that, that you pass on to us in, in so many different ways. And Lord, we just praise your name today. You are worthy of our praise and so much more. Lord, we pray that you would uh, help our nation, uh, bring healing to our nation. Lord, we, we need to keep coming to you. We need, we need revival. We, we, need, we need you. We need you to to bring us together. Lord, be with our leaders as a nation. Be with our president. Be with our governor. Be with all the local leaders. Lord, help them to make wise decisions that are in line with your will that will bring us back together. Lord, we, we lift up this coronavirus situation and all reports are that it, it seems to be spreading more uh, in the last several days. And we just, just pray, Lord, that uh, uh, you would would help us to do what we need to do to be wise, to bring this uh, as quickly as we can to, to uh, at least a better place. Lord, lead, guide, and, and direct. Be with doctors and nurses and first responders. Lord, bless them, encourage them. This has been such a, a long, hard road, and we just pray that you would be, be very near to them and help them, Lord. Be with those that are uh, by, by need staying at home and, and, and help them, Lord, and, and encourage their hearts to know that you are with them and those in the nursing homes. And uh, Lord, protect them from, from this disease, Lord. We just pray that you would, would be very near to them. Lord, we lift up uh, those in, in our church that need a special touch from you, Lord. We, we pray that you would uh, uh, continue to be with Yvonne, Lord, continue to help her as she recovers from, from her procedure and Lord, just, just help her each and every day. Lord, we lift up Norman to you. We pray that you would be, be near to him, Lord. Just continue to help him as he heals from his fall. Lord, we lift up Edda to you and, and Mary Howe. We pray that you would be with them both as they deal with cancer. And uh, no doubt many others that are dealing with cancer, Lord, just bring healing to their bodies. But encourage their hearts to know that you are with them, that you are near. Lord, we, uh, we lift up Richard Hale to you and most likely having a, a pretty serious heart procedure this next week. And we pray that you would just uh, uh, touch him, be near to him, Lord. Uh, may the procedure go well. Lord, we lift up Daryl Reedy. We thank you for being with him as he uh, had surgery this past week. Continue the healing process in him. Lord, I know there's many other requests, all those watching and all those here. And and some of them maybe nobody knows about. We lift those up to you, and we just pray that you would meet the need, Lord. You are faithful to do that. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise. Be with our missionaries, Lord. Encourage them. Help them, Lord. Be with us as a church. Lead us and guide us in all that we do, Lord, that we could all bring glory to you. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise. We give you glory. In the strong name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Well, uh, as we get to the sermon today, uh, we're back in the, the talking about the walk of faith. Uh, certain Bible stories, you know, have need no introduction. And, and, you know, it's really true when you think about it. There's a lot of them, you know, that, that, you, that people know, even if they've 
you really never uh, don't read their Bibles very often or much, uh, but yet they've still heard of certain stories. You know, there's Adam and Eve and Noah and the ark and, and, and you know, Moses and the people of Israel going through the Red Sea, the parting of the Red Sea, uh, Jonah and the big fish, David and Goliath, uh, Daniel and the lion's den, many, many other stories of Scripture that, that people know, that people uh, experience or have experienced or know in some way. And today I want to talk about one of them that, that um, it, it's kind of like that. It fits into that category. It's a common story, and it's, it's Abraham and Isaac. When, when God uh, told Isaac to take his son, uh, or told Abraham to take his son Isaac and, and to sacrifice him. And, it, and it's really an amazing story. And I, I think one of the primary reasons that, that Abraham is, is called the father of faith is, is this is this story, and, and it's why in, in Hebrews chapter 11 that we've been looking at for several weeks now, it's, it's why Abraham gets, gets so much play, he gets so much airtime uh, in, these, in these short verses. And, and it's, in, you know, in this story, there's certain things about it that just sort of draw us into the scene. Uh, we, we see Abraham, he's having, he has this encounter with God where God speaks to him, God asking him to do the unthinkable. Uh, we see by faith Abraham is, is ready to do what God has, has asked him to do, what God has called him to do. And um, we, we see a, a father and a son preparing to go on this trek together into the mountains. And, and you, you can just imagine as they're getting ready, making preparation, the, the, the father's heart is just breaking over what's to come. And then their son is just kind of oblivious to it all and kind of has some questions, but... You know, we see Isaac carrying the wood and Abraham building the altar. And then the moment comes and Abraham binds his son and he places him on the altar. And you can just imagine Isaac waiting for the knife to fall and Abraham with his hands raised, ready, ready to bring down the knife. And then, and then... <laughs> it's no wonder that the, the writer of Hebrews focuses on this scene. Uh, by the way, the picture on the screen up here and, and, uh, is of the Temple Mount. And, and this is uh, uh, what, what Scott, some scholars believe to be uh, Mount Moriah, where this uh, event took place. And uh, uh, it, it's, you know, there's some disagreement about that, but, but, but that's why we have the picture up here with our, our slides today. Well, I want to read for you Hebrews 11, 17 to 19, where, where we see this story from the writer of Hebrews perspective. This is what it says. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it's through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Now, so I've always been intrigued by this story, uh, I, and, it, and it became even more fascinating to me as a, as a father uh, because I, I can't imagine what it would have been like to be Abraham here, to go through this, this event. Uh, how could Abraham even think about killing his own child, sacrificing his son, even if, if he believed that God had asked him to do it? I mean, I, I just can't, can't begin to, to fathom that. The only answer I can come up with is because he really believed that God wanted him to do this. Uh, is this amazing faith. He believed, he trusted, he had faith that God would somehow work all this out. That somehow, you know, God was in control and, and would take care of this situation. Like I said, somehow, we don't know, you know, he didn't know exactly. But, but I want us to think today about three aspects of this story. Uh, of, of his amazing faith that we see here in, in this greatest trial he would ever face and probably the greatest trial anyone has, has, has ever faced when you think about it, uh, a, a trial of faith. Um, maybe other than Jesus approaching the cross, right? I mean, that took, that's another whole level here. But, but let's begin with this. And, and, and here, here's three things. Here's the first thing. And we see Abraham's test. And kind of already talked about that a little bit, but, but again, verse 17, it says, By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. 
he who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Now, in, in reading this story, when we come to this story, we have a lot. We have some problems that come up in our in our minds. Uh, the first and biggest has to do with this issue of of God's character. Who is God? How could God ask Abraham to do this? How could a loving God? ask Abraham to sacrifice his only God, only son. I mean, it, it, it's, it seems unthinkable. And, and some critics have even said this, you know, they just kind of dismiss this story. They say, it's, it's do, it doesn't right. It's not right. You know, well, how is this in the Bible even? And, and they just dismiss it because it just presents this ugly picture of, of who God is. And, and, and I understand that feeling, but, but God is God. We're not. His ways are not our ways. And, and we are hardly in a position to question God. And, and that, I think we just have to kind of step back from that and, and, and maybe think about that a little bit. And there's a second problem. It kind of goes along with the first problem, but it, you know, more or less related to the first. Because God asking Abraham to sacrifice his, his son is, is uncomfortable to us. We, we unconsciously tend to, to move to the end of the story. And we approach this, this story from the point of view of the end. In other words, we know that, that, that Abraham doesn't, doesn't kill Isaac. And so we, we kind of approach it from that angle. We think, well, you know, it, it's all right because, uh, you know, Abraham didn't really end up have to kill his son and all that. And we say, you know, see, God never wanted Isaac to, to, to die in the first place. And, and I, I know that, that there is truth in that statement that, you know, that, that God never wanted Isaac to die. Um, but, but, but we risk missing something when we approach it from that direction. We, we miss the meaning of this story, of this text, if we go too far ahead down the road. Uh, the reality is that God asked Abraham to, to, to sacrifice his son, to kill his son for him. And, and by faith, Abraham took steps to follow up on that request. So if we go back to Genesis 22, where this story first happened, where we first read about it, and we see what's at stake. And this is what it says. Is sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Now, it would have been enough for God to say, just take your son, right? I mean, everybody would have known who he's talking about. Abraham would have known, you know, what was going on. But, but God qualifies the phrase in, in three ways. He, he qualifies, uh, first of all, he says, your only son. Now, sort of forgetting Ishmael and, and uh, you know, was also his son. But, but, but what he's referring to here is, is, his, is the son of promise. Uh, he, Isaac was the promised son. Uh, then God makes it clear. He calls him by name. He says, Isaac, right? Okay, the, the son for whom Abraham and Sarah had, had waited forever, it seemed like, 25 years or so. Finally, God says, whom you love. Now, <laughs> it, it might seem as if God were mocking him a little bit, you know. I know you love him, but I want you to, to kill him for me. Uh, but these words were really meant to reassure him that God knew what he was asking Abraham to give up, what he was asking Abraham to, to sacrifice. You know, by saying it this way, by saying it these three different ways, God is, is well, Abraham would know that God understood what it was going to cost him to give up his son. This wasn't any old child. This was the child of promise. This is the child that that Abraham and, and Sarah loved. And, and God just lays it out there. And, and, and it, you know, either you obey or you don't, Abraham. It's, it's, it's left up to Abraham. It's Abraham's choice. Jo Abraham, what are you going to do? Are you going to listen or not? Well, let's be clear about what this test is all about. God was asking for Abraham to travel with his son to Mount Moriah, three days journey, to possibly, as we said before, to possibly what is today Jerusalem, build an altar, most likely with stones, and then make a platform of wood on the stones. That's what they would do. And then Abraham was to bind Isaac, make him lie down on the wood, take a knife and slit Abraham, or Isaac's throat in the same way that a sacrificial lamb would be, would be killed. Finally, he would light the wood, burning his son's body as an offering to God. I mean, it's unthinkable. This is what God told Abraham to do. I mean, we, we, we can't get away 
from, from the, uh, how harsh this scene is, how real this scene is. And again, we can't look at it from the end of the story. We need to go from, we've got to think about Abraham at the beginning. This is what God told Abraham to do. It, and at that, at that point, really, a man of faith only has two options, right? I mean, he can either obey or not. And, and, and you know, if you stop to argue, and, and, and you know, uh, that, that, in, that in itself is, a, a, uh, is being disobedient, if you try to talk God out of it, maybe that's a disobedience as, as well. And, and, and you can't really come up with an alternate plan. This is God's plan. This is what God says. And, and you know, God's been clear on his expectations here, right? So this is the test that Abraham faces. So then we come to Abraham's answer. His answer is to trust, to have faith. This is the second aspect of the story. Abraham's trust is the test and then the trust. Verse 18 says, Even though God had said to him, It is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Now, at this point, the, the writer of Hebrews is, is wanting us to think about what's at stake. We, we immediately think of the unimaginable sorrow of, of losing a child. To any parent, I mean, that, that's, a, that's tragedy beyond words, right? I mean, it, you know, nothing is more, seems more unnatural than a parent having to bury a child. The death of a child is like a period before the end of the sentence. It's not supposed to happen that way. In this case, God told Abraham to offer his own son, his only son, and Abraham was fully prepared to do it. So, so prepared, in fact, that Hebrews eleven seventeen actually says that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice, Me meaning that, that when he laid his son on the altar and raised the knife, he fully intended to, to kill his son, to put his son to death. It, it's really incredible, and it shows the depth of faith that Abraham had. But the writer also wants us to think about something else. God had already promised to make Abraham the head of a great nation. Uh, and through that nation to, to bless the whole world, right? You know, we, we see at the beginning, you know, back at, at the beginning of Genesis chapter 12. That nation was promised to come from Isaac's descendants. But, but that couldn't happen, I mean, obviously, right? That couldn't happen if Isaac, who was a teenager at the time, had no children, if Isaac was dead. It seems to be an enormous contradiction, right? I mean, it is to us. Think what it would have been to, to Abraham living in that moment. But Abraham is operating by faith. And we said this a few weeks ago when, when we were talking about Abraham leaving Ur and, and you know, Ur of the Chaldeans or whatever. But, but faith believes and leaves the how up to God. Leaves it in, hand, in the hands of God. God commanded him to offer his son Isaac. Abraham knew that. God, he also knew that God had promised to bring forth offspring through Isaac. Now, how can those two possibly work together? Uh, I have no idea. Abraham had no idea. Now, he had some ideas. But the big thing is he just trusted he believed. He had faith. It seems that if Abraham obeys the command, I mean, it seems to us anyway, if, if Abraham obeys this command, it cancels the promise. Isaac would be dead. If he disobeys the, the command, what happens to the promise then? I mean, he's not living in God's will and all that kind of stuff. It, it's a real pickle. It's a, it's a, it's a no-win situation. Other than Abraham says, okay, I'm going to take one step at a time. I'm going to take one step at a time. Yeah, it's a pickle, but I, Abraham says, okay, God, you called me to do this. I'm going to do it one step at a time. He, he's just trusting God. And that's the amazing nature of Abraham's faith. He didn't know how God would do it. He just knew God would do it somehow. This is a lesson for all of us. When God makes a promise or directs you to do something, it's foolish to wonder the how, you know? It's foolish to, to want, worry and wonder about the how, how God will keep his word. Our job is to always obey. Faith doesn't have to worry about the hows. Faith believes and leaves the how in the hands of God. 
If we spend too much time trying to figure out how God will take care of us, we're likely to just talk, talk ourselves into a corner. We're going to, uh, all kinds of things are going to happen, right? That doesn't mean we don't spend time in preparation and planning and all those kind of things. And, you know, but, but things out of our control, things, you know, maybe we, we uh, what we believe are beyond our strength. You know, what we don't think we can accomplish or do beyond our ability or whatever, we leave those things to God. Again, we need to, to remember as we look at this story that, that Abraham has no idea, none, zero idea of what was about to happen when he and Isaac started out on that journey. You know, their three-day journey up to Mount Moriah. He set out to obey God knowing, believing the one who had called him to offer his beloved son would solve this issue, this, this, uh, this question of how there are times in life, there are many times in life when our only job is to take the next step. We aren't called to figure out the big picture, right? To explain how it will get there, where it will lead, or any of those questions. God says, go, and we go. God says, stop, and we stop. God says, wait, and we wait. God, God says, give me your dearest possession, and we offer it to him. This is the life of faith. So we see Abraham's test. We, we see his trust. And, and the third aspect we see in this story is Abraham's triumph. Verse 19 says, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. In this verse, we learn something that is only hinted at in Genesis 22. Twice in that chapter, Abraham implies that uh, he, you know, he expects somehow that uh, God was going to work things out for Isaac, you know, that Isaac would live. Verse 5, Abraham uh, saw Mount Moriah in the distance and, and he gave his instructions to his, his servants. He said, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we'll come back. You know the story uh, to you. And, and, you know, they say, we will come back. Abraham says, we will come back, not I. Abraham, by faith, believed he and his son somehow would return uh, together. Uh, then as the two of them are walking along, Isaac's carrying the wood for the sacrifice. And, and you know, he sees the knife and he says, you know, everything's in place, uh, Dad. He, you know, he's talking to his dad, Abraham, and he said, where's the lamb for the burnt offering? And in verse 8, Abraham replies, God himself will, reply, will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Well, the... The, the writer of Hebrews tells us uh, uh, why, why Abraham could talk like that. He reasoned, he believed that God could raise the dead. Still, he didn't know how. He'd never seen that happen before. He just trusted. He, he just had this deep abiding faith. Abraham b believed that he and his son would somehow return together. Pretty much he's thinking, you know, his thinking was, I, I don't know how, it's, how he's going to do it. But if he wants to, God could even raise from the dead, raise him for the, from the dead. Now, that's pretty amazing when no one, I don't think there's anybody in Scripture up to that point who had been raised from the dead. <laughs> Later on, we know Jesus was raised from the dead. We know Lazarus was raised from the, de raised from the dead. Uh, even, I think, there's a few others in the Old Testament later on. But nobody up to that time had been raised from the dead. It's pretty amazing. But somehow, Abraham believed. Now, it turns out that Abraham was partially right. God can raise the dead. And, you know, a, a, a fact proved pretty, you know, uh, pretty close to that spot many years later when Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, but he was wrong about Isaac dying that day. He didn't literally die because at the very last second, Abraham saw a ram caught in a thicket, a ram placed there by God, and he offered the ram as a sacrifice in place of his son. So as the writer of Hebrews says, he, in a manner of speaking, did receive Isaac back from the dead. This was Abraham's triumph. It was his faith at its highest point. Now, now we can stand back and, and we can, you know, see the story in, in clear perspective. You know, did God ask Abraham to, to sacrifice his son Isaac? Yes. Was it a legitimate request? Yes. Did, did Abraham know in advance how the story would end? No. Specifically, did he know about the ram in the thicket? No. Well, then what, what was it that Abraham knew? He knew what God had asked him to do, right? 
He knew that God had promised to give him a son through whom he would bless the world. What he didn't know was how God was going to reconcile his promise, you know, to bless the world through Isaac and his command to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. Even though the command was, was made, made no sense from a human perspective, uh, Abraham intended to obey. He obeyed it anyway. He didn't know it, didn't have the answers, even though it meant killing God's son of promise. How could a person do such a thing? Because he believed that God could raise the dead. For 2,000 years, Christians have seen this story as a picture of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In Genesis 22, we see a man who would uh, uh, do for the, for the, what, what man would do for the love of God. But at Calvary, we see what God would do for the love of man. Abraham was only asked to sacrifice Isaac. God actually sacrificed his son, Jesus. When God's hand was raised at Calvary, there was no, there was no one to cry out, stop. There was no one to say, oh, there's a ram over in the thicket. Jesus was the ram. So God's hand fell in judgment on his own son in our place for our sins he died for jesus died for you and for me what are we supposed to take away from this story of abraham and isaac how is it supposed to change us when i read genesis 22 i'm struck by something god said to abraham after after the greatest test ever ever given uh, after the test is over the ram is sacrificed isaac spared the promise reaffirmed and it comes as part of the happy ending to a very great test. And, and God says to Abraham, do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. That's verse 12. He basically says the same thing again in verse, verse 16. You have not withheld anything from me. God says, I asked for your most precious possession and you gave it to me. As I read that, it, it makes me think of a song we're going to close with in, in a few minutes in a little bit. Uh, we're not there yet, but when we get there, we're going to sing it. Uh, it's an old hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be Consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of Thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for Thee. Take my love my Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee, all for thee, everything to the Lord. The idea is simple. Everything we have, everything we are, everything we hope to be, it all belongs to God. We need to offer it up to him. Faith is about making an offering out of our, our lives, out of ourselves, of everything. I, I think, at least he does it for me. I'll, I'll put it that way. I, I, God leads me, anyway, again and again up Mount Moriah, where we are asked to sacrifice the dearest and, and nearest, the best things we have in our lives to him. We've talked about before how an idol can be anything, anything even that's good that becomes important to us that has power over us than it should have. And, and I've talked before about a piece of ooey gooey chocolate cake and, and it, it, how too often it has power over me, more power over me than it should. Uh, and it can become a God in my life. And, and for Father's Day last week, my, my daughter Molly uh, made me a cake like that. And, and it was awesome. And it was, it was hard to, to eat it in moderation. Uh, Maggie made me some chocolate chip cookies and, and oh, they were so good. And it was hard to not let those things have more power over me than it did. Now, we, we did, we, we made that cake stretch out basically over all week, and we really did well. And cookies, they went a little bit faster. But anyway, uh, I think the others dipped into the cookies a little more than anyway. Chocolate cake is certainly one of God's good gifts. In one of his books, Watchman Nee said that we approach God like little children with open hands begging for gifts, we, we want more and more gifts. Because he's a good God, he fills our hands 
with good things, life and health and friends and, and money and success and recognition and challenge and marriage and children, a nice home, a good job, even chocolate cake and, and, and chocolate chip cookies. And, and so like children, we rejoice in the things that he gives us. We rejoice in what we receive and we run around <laughs> too often. We compare ourselves. This is what Washington needs to say. We, we compare ourselves to what what we have with each other, you know, what others have as well. And, and, and Nee says, when our hands are finally full, God says, my child, I long to have fellowship with you. Reach out your hand and take my hand. But we can't do it because our hands are so full. God, we can't, we cry, Nee says. He says, put those things aside and take my hand. No, we can't. It's too hard to put them down. And God says, but I am the one who gave them to you in the first place. Oh, God, what you have asked is too hard. Please don't ask us to put these things aside. God answers quietly. You must. We must. What is the thing in your life that you're holding too tightly to? You know, recently I've been thinking for some, it's their politics. It's Facebook. But it can be anything. It can be a job or success or family, even church or chocolate cake. We love our idols. Elizabeth Elliot makes the point that the, the process of Christian growth is one in which God breaks the idols in our lives one by one by one. Oh, she says, oh, how painful it is because by definition we love our idols. We protect them because they give us strength and hope and meaning. The tricky part is that our idols are often good things. Like I said, they're very good things. Good things that we hold on to too tightly, like chocolate cake. Things that, that have become too important to us than they should be. That's the real challenge of this story. Abraham had to come to a place where he was willing to give back to God what God had given to him. You know, God's greatest gift in his life. He had to offer that back up to God, and we have to do the same thing. God gives us so many good things. Oh, it's hard to lay them aside so we can take his hand. And his hand's more important than anything else, right? I think we all agree with that. In this day and age, we hold too tightly to everything. We need to hold loosely lightly to the things that we value greatly because it doesn't belong to us anyway. We, we come into this life with nothing. We're going to go out of this life with nothing. In between, God fills our, our hands with good things, and, and then he asks us to give them back to him and, and so that we can better walk in relationship to him. Oh, how painful this process is, but how important it is. The process of letting go is really the, uh, the work of a lifetime but it's really the walk of faith. Are we going to trust God enough to give the good things that he's given us back to him? It seems to be a lesson we all need to learn over and over and over again. God and his kindness keeps bringing us back to Mount Moriah, back to that place of sacrifice, back to the place where we offer up to God our dearest and our, our most, the things we love most. And we say, Lord, it all belongs to you. Now, I notice I said a minute ago, God in his kindness. This is an act of kindness from God. It's the kindness of God that led Abraham to Mount Moriah. And it's God's kindness that leads us back to a place of sacrifice where we yield up to him our dreams, our desires, our plans, our hopes, the, the things we own, our dearest friends, our, our loved ones. And finally, we give to him the life that he gave to us in the beginning. It's God's kindness that's on display in this story. Some people say, no, it's just his, I don't know, maybe it's him being tricky or whatever, I don't know. But no, it's God's kindness in this story. When we are struggling with God and trying so desperately to hold on to those things that we value so much, it may not feel like God's kindness at all. We, he knows better than we do that, that good things can become idols to us. And any idol, especially the good things, uh, come between us and God. Anything that comes between God and us, the, the God who loves us supremely and, and wants only the best for us, when we, when we finally have the courage to let go, when we stop trying so desperately to hold on, when we open our hands to God, when we hold lightly to the things of this world, to the things that we even value greatly, 
When we give back to God what has always been his, then and only then are we truly free. Then we can know God's peace and love and joy and all the good things he has for us in that way. But, but I think freedom is the right word. When we can say, Lord, I have no idea how this is all going to work out. All I know is all this belongs to you. Do with it as you will. The Lord says, bring, bring your dearest and your best to the altar and leave it in my hands. In that place is freedom. Freedom. God orchestrates the affairs of life, the good and the bad and the happy and the sad. And, and, and he brings us to that place where, where our faith will be in him alone. Through all of this, our Heavenly Father leads us along the pathway of complete trust in Him, of complete faith in Him. Slowly but surely, we discover the things that we thought were important, we thought we couldn't live without, don't matter as much as we thought they did. Now, I, I think that's something that's gone on during this, this whole coronavirus thing. We've kind of been stripped of some of those things we thought were super important. But, but anyway... Even the dearest and sweetest things of life take second place to the pleasure of knowing God. In the end, we discover that he has emptied our hands of everything and then filled them with himself. We need to learn to keep an open hand, to hold lightly to what we value greatly because it all belongs to God anyway. Wrap up with just, just uh, another, you know, just going back to this hymn we're going to, going to sing in a moment take my life take my moments and my days take my hands my feet my love myself my will my heart all of these things take them can you put them on the altar can you give it all back to the lord it, it's his anyway he's the one that gave it to you life doesn't work without him but will you lay it down before him or will you hold on tightly? Will you live as a captive to the stuff? Or will you give it in freedom back to him? Will you be miserable or will you be free? Mark 8, 36, Jesus said, What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Maybe that's our real problem. <laughs> We've been given so much and we want more. We want, we want the whole world. We think we need the whole world. And we don't dare let go. Somewhere in the process, we lose our soul. So here's the deal. You can keep the world for a moment, but you'll have to give it up at the end. Or you can keep your soul by letting go of the things that were never yours anyway and gain everything. What is your Isaac? What is it that you're holding on to tightly to? Are you willing to lay it down for Jesus' sake? Let's sing, take my life and let it be. Let's sing together.
Let's pray together. Lord, help us to do this, to sacrifice ourselves, our lives to you. And whether you're watching online or, or here tonight, Lord, if, if someone needs to do this, I pray that you would help them. I no doubt Abraham only did what he did because of your work in his life. Lord, help us all to be people of such strong faith that whatever you ask, that we will do it, that we will trust you, that no matter what happens, that, that it'll be okay because you're in charge, you're in control. Help us to hold lightly to the things of this world. Help us to realize that it, it's not worth it to hold on to as much stuff as we can, can hold on to. You are worth it. You are worth more than everything. Oh, Lord, help us to look to you, to turn to you, to live for you, to, to lay our lives as a sacrifice before you because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross and dying for us and dying for our sins, but being the ultimate sacrifice, Lord, then we can, in response, return that to you, return our love to you, serve you, follow you. Lord, help us. Thank you, Lord. Be with each one. Just ask your greatest blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks for, for watching today. Thank you for being here. Have a great, uh, great day. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.